I'd like to welcome everybody to, this is the fifth annual Education uh, Cancer Symposium. And I've been, you know, so excited that through the years, I've been involved for the last five years, that this whole thing has grown, the support that we've had. And I'm so Danny, happy so to say that we actually have people from all over the world on webcast. So I'd like to welcome all the people who have joined by webcast. And thank you so much for coming out in person um, as well. I'll be your moderator today. My name is Libya Scheller. Um, I am part of the board of directors of the Stomach Cancer Foundation, of the Debbie Stream Foundation. And um, I want to um, say a little bit about some housekeeping things just to keep your day very comfortable. Uh, the first thing I'd like to say is, um, just for anybody who's in the room, if you have your cell phones, please put them on silent. And um, for the bathroom, please leave through the back of the room, not the side of the room. They're just outside and to the left. And I know that we're here to have a lot of questions answered. We have a great panel of speakers. I'm so excited to introduce the speakers that we have today. And we have an unbelievable patient panel that's going to you know, uh, talk about their experience. And so there's gonna be a lot of questions that are gonna be asked. Number one, the people online, we will have, I will be on my computer. So wh while the speakers are talking and you have a question, feel free to ask your question. And when it's time for question and answers, I will ask your questions. Those who are here in the room, there's two ways you can answer, ask a question. We have blue cards in your packet, so if you have a question during the question, you can raise the blue card if you don't want to speak in the mic. If you want to ask your question in the mic, feel free to raise your hand, and we'll have people from the back of the room coming up, so that way you'll have your questions asked. I will try to get to all the questions. Um, that's Sometimes it's a little difficult because there's a lot of questions to be asked, so um, I will try to get to all of them with the time a uh, lot needed. So the slides for today, we're going to be giving a lot of information. The slides will be presented on both sides, both panels here, and they will also be available online at the website as well as a video of this particular um, session that we have today. So you'll be able to go back and take a look at it. Lunch will be served today. Uh, if you didn't get your coffee or your breakfast, we have those outside, and lunch will be served today, so we don't have to worry about eating and all that. And I hope all of you um, have received your beautiful gastric cancer pin, if you're not wearing it. You can probably see mine right here. Um, the other thing I want to find out is who's in the room. Um, I'm, by show of hands, I'm going to put, I'm going to name a category, and you please raise your hand. And I'm going to ask first if you are a doctor, a nurse, another healthcare professional, a patient, a caregiver slash family, one group, or a friend. So let's first start with how many doctors do we have in the room? Please raise your hand. Great, thank you, and welcome. How about nurses? Thank you. How about other HCP? Healthcare professional, thank you. We have two in the front here. How about a patient? How many patients do we have? Oh, wonderful, welcome. I just wanna to say today is your day. This day is for you as, uh, in particular. And what about uh, a caregiver or family member? Thank you for all your support. Thank you for all your support. How about a friend who's here to support? Great. Thank you so much for attending. OK, next, sorry? Advocate, patient advocate. OK, thank you very much. Thank you. We have five, six, wonderful, and one in the back. Thank you very much. And other. OK, we have one, other, and volunteers. Thank you so much. So you know, putting this something like this together, next slide, please. And if we can, um, Dylan, there's, if you can, there's a volume here that I'm hearing myself talk. If somebody can fix this up front, that would be great in the meantime. Thank you so much. So what I'd like to do is, you know, something like this, to put this together, we have some incredible people that gave their support and sponsored this conference. I'd like to thank our title sponsor, which is Boston Biomedical. 
I'd like to also thank others who participated as well, which EMD Serrano, we have Genentech, the Cleveland Clinic, we have, and it's hard for me to read, Mad Madeline and Danny Zellman, who are here, the parents of Debbie, um, Debbie Zellman um, and Andrew Gutman, Pat and Maureen Compola. We have uh, Memorial Cancer Center and my CME HME. So thank you so much for your support. Thank you. Being supported by these companies really helps us a lot in getting the education that we want um, to uh, disseminate to you. So thank you very much to our sponsors. Next slide. Another thing, in order to put something like this together, there's a lot of people that put an effort to organize all of this. So I'd like to thank our stomach patient panel who are here in the front, and they're going to be the first people that we talk that we uh, present here. We have Ekaterina, we have Teresa. We have Nelson and Vicki. Thank you so much for coming today. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Next slide. Oh, no, stay there. Go back. So one of the things I want to do, we have an incredible panel today that um, is going to be organized like this. The first, we're going to have the stomach cancer patients and caregivers panel that are going to be presenting um, first, followed by followed by integrative medicine and nutritional considerations by Dr. Kathleen Wessa. And next slide, please. We're going to talk about novel surgical options by Dr. Brian Bagwell from the MD Anderson, followed by non-surgical treatment options by Dr. Richard Kim. Next slide. We're going to break after that for lunch, um, and lunch will be in, you know, in this room here. And one of the great things is I'll be able to introduce to you the founder of the Debbie's Dream Foundation, um, Debbie Zellman, who will give us a background and history of this organization. Followed by a presentation by Dr. Adam Bass, who will give a talk on genomics from the Data-Farber Cancer Institute. Then we will have a presentation, which I'm sure a lot of you uh, would like to know a lot about clinical trials. And Dr. Edith Mitchell from Thomas Jefferson University will be, um, will be talking about clinical trials and will be supported as well by a panelist, David Ilson from the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, who also does a lot of clinical trials in this arena. And the last topic that we'll, we will cover is radiation oncology. And we have um, Dr. Cl Lawrence Kleinberg from the Sidney Kemble Cancer Institute from Johns Hopkins. So we have a great panel. Really excited for all of you. Thank you so much for, for coming. <clears throat> Next slide. OK, so one of the things is just just to give you a little bit of background on, if you haven't visited our website, we are on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, LinkedIn, and Pinterest. And of course, visit our website for a lot of information that we have there, www.debbiesdream.org. Next slide. One of the things that's very important um, to us is um, f to, um, you know, we, we have a big fundraiser this evening. And for any time that you would like to donate um, any kind of funds to our organization, please go to our website. And what, one of the things that we do is we do fund research. Next slide. And we have quite a few events coming up. Next slide. More slides. We have some upcoming events, which we'll have to, I'm sorry, but I thought we had a slide on um, recent events coming up. They're all listed on our website. We have. I'm going to give a plug for this evening. We have a very big gala this evening where we raise money um, for this organization in particularly to give uh, some support to young scientists um, in the worldwide for research. So please go to our website and find out that information. Oh, here we go. Thank you. Upcoming educational programming. We also do Nutrition and Clinical Trials webinars. And as you can see, May 6th, May 10th, and July 8th, this is a great place for you to find out um, any kind of, um, uh, you know, anything you want to learn about nutrition and clinical trials or will be done on that day. We have our another 
Stomach Cancer Educational Symposium that will be taking place in Chicago on November 7th. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, something's going on with the slides, so sorry about that. Okay, without further ado, one of the things I'd like to do is, um, you know, I've already introduced our, our panel, so thank you so much for being here. And one of the things we'll, we go over with the, you know, from the very beginning is, um, Vicki, if you can please, um, you know, introduce yourself and how you were diagnosed and what stage. Hi, my name is Vicki Judy. I'm from Lexington, Kentucky. I am a stage four stomach cancer survivor. I was diagnosed uh, through an endoscopic ultrasound of signet ring cell. Uh, the doctor had planned to do a partial or total gastrectomy, and he found a stage four gastric cancer um, inoperable, incurable, and, but treatable. Uh, I'm 28 months out. Um, I'm feeling pretty good. Um, have lots of scans done, and I've been through some chemotherapy treatments. Um, I'm also a stage three breast cancer survivor, invasive lob lobular carcinoma. I had to have a mastectomy for that and radiation. Thank you so much, and thank you for being here. Teresa, same question for you. Hi, um, my name is Teresa Tiano. I'm from Toronto, Canada. I was diagnosed in July of 2011, a week before my 45th birthday, with uh, stage two cancer, and it was diagnosed through regular testing. I have a family history of uh, colorectal cancer, and I am also, um, I have Lin Lynch syndrome, so uh, it's a genetic mutation, so I'm a high-risk patient. Nelson. Good morning. My name is Nelson Savello. Um, I was initially diagnosed uh, almost two years ago in June of 2013. Uh, it was about six months after I had had my initial symptoms uh, and had my of uh, gallstones and had my gallbladder out. Um, so I guess woulda, coulda, shoulda, I would have been diagnosed about six months earlier but it turns out that I was diagnosed um, not early, but early enough. I too had, uh, after uh, several cats, uh, which turned up little, I did have an, uh, an ultra, uh, endoscopic ultrasound with biopsy, and that's ultimately what did the preliminary diagnosis. I, that was done <clears throat> at a, uh, in a regular GI practice, and then I moved on to a cancer hospital where they wanted to verify the diagnosis by doing a, uh, a diagnostic laparoscopic procedure in which they went in and did a cell wash as well as a second EUS endoscopic ultrasound. So they were taking biopsies from both inside the stomach and outside. It was determined that I had um, a rare form of cancer known as lenitis plastica that it covered 60% of my stomach wall and that I would have to have a total gastrectomy. Um, in the end, um, you can say that my diagnosis was stage two, but in fact, the way they, they do this in a technical sense is I was a T for tumor, stage two, three, N for near re regional metastasis was zero, and M for distant metastasis was also zero. Uh, that is called a clinical diagnosis, um, and that's as best as you can know before surgery. After surgery, due to the effect of the chemo, uh, I was ultimately diagnosed post-surgically through, uh, uh, through the pathology report as a 1B. So the chemo actually knocked my staging down from the clinical level. Great. Thank you. Uh, hi. My name is Ekaterina. Um, so I got diagnosed in 2011. Uh, the way that I got diagnosed was I was writing my final exams and I actually ended up uh, passing out uh, during my exams. Uh, what happened was uh, I actually had bleeding ulcers. And uh, initially, nobody suspected anything because of my young age. Um, I was 21 at the time. And uh, when they finally did the scope, um, 
you know, again, everyone was calm about it, but they took a biopsy just in case, and it turned out that I had stage 1B um, gastric cancer. Uh, because of my high-grade tumor and because of my young age, uh, they were quite concerned that it would uh, spread quickly, so I actually had a total gastrectomy, um, despite being stage 1B. So um, after th uh, the total gastrectomy, they took out 28 lymph nodes out of the 28, two were... Um, two had cancer in them. And uh, after that, I had the McDonald protocol. So that's uh, a five fluorouracil uh, chemotherapy with uh, one month of radiation in the middle. Thank you so much. You know, you've all been through <clears throat> an incredible ordeal uh, yourself and your families. And um, one of the things that, you know, you're here as a patient panel that you can share with with all of us is like, what was the one thing that, um, if you had to share with someone um, in the audience, if you wanted to tell them um, some guidance or some words of inspiration, what would that be? So Vicki, we'll start with you. Well, I guess the one thing would be to stay off the internet and uh, read the stats and <laughs> things like that. And if you don't want the answers to the very hard questions, I was told by the uh, surgeon not to ask the oncologist what my uh, prognosis was. And um, uh, I would just say that you just take one day, each, take each day one day at a time and, um, you know, just be as positive as you can and just, you know, don't think it's over because it's not. Um, 28 months out and I still have my stomach. Thank you so much. Teresa, same question. So if there was the one thing that I could tell people is perhaps to take it one minute at a time because there are days where you don't think you're going to get through the next minute, but you do. Um, also to ask lots of questions of your medical team because if you're not satisfied with the answers that you're getting, it's your life and it's your body and you have to be your best advocate and also to have an incredible uh, support group, which I was very fortunate to have um, because they actually carry you through everything and they're there with you and they lift you up when you're at the deepest, darkest points in your life, but mainly uh, to be very involved in your treatment and your care. Thank you. Nelson, same question. Yes, I apologize in advance if this starts to sound a little repetitive, but... Uh... I have a lot of the same words that Teresa had. I thought about what messages I would have to give someone if we were stuck in an elevator for about 30 seconds, and that's all the time I had. And there really are three messages, and this is very much oversimplified. But number one, early detection. Uh, I am convinced that none of us would be sitting here this morning without early detection, and I know that's a complicated one. Um, number two, be proactive. Uh, I would not have been diagnosed in time. Um, six doctors looked at two CAT scans and, and did not see cancer. I was uncomfortable after my gallbladder surgery that something was amiss, it wasn't right. I asked to read the CATs again, and I found the word <clears throat> carcinoma in the CAT scan. No one had pointed that out to me until I asked for the report. This was the second CAT. It was just kind of bypassed. You must be your own proactive healthcare advocate. You have to get involved. You have to understand. I know that a lot of people like to put their head in the sand, but that won't get you results. And then the third thing I'll borrow from Teresa, have an advocate. My wife, Patty, my daughter, Lauren, who's an acupuncturist, um, all my friends and family, we started an email kind of a chat line going, those emails would lift me up, would keep me going day to day. Uh, I was decided to be open and not secretive about this, and I encourage others to do that. Bring the community. It takes a village to get through something like this. It's, it's, a, it's a very tough one. And if I can have the soapbox later, I'd like to talk about early detection, because I, I can't accept the fact that in this type of cancer, we just throw our arms up and say there are no biomarkers, there is no screening tools, you know, there is, you know, we can't have early detection. So I, I'd like to talk to the board of DDF about making that part of our mission. Great, thank you. 
I will definitely make a note of that. <laughs> and I agree with you very much. As you know, the same thing happened to Debbie. Um, and early detection is something that we advocate as well. Thank you for that, Nelson. Ekaterina. Uh, so yeah, so my advice, I guess, to go with what everyone's already said is uh, definitely be your own advocate. Um, there's so much information being thrown at you when you're first diagnosed. Um, and being diagnosed, you're just emotionally overwhelmed. And definitely having um, a strong support system is, is a must. Uh, my parents, they actually, they camped out um, at my surgical oncologist office. And I know a lot of the doctors here will probably not approve of that. But they camped out um, at their office, making sure that I got the surgeon that I, I needed to get. And I got the surgery as soon as I could get. So having that support system, I could not have done it myself personally because I was just a wreck. Uh, being diagnosed at, at the time. Um, so, so definitely be your own advocate, but make sure that uh, people around you uh, can help. And, you know, with Debbie's Dream Foundation, there are people that are willing to, to help out. So, you know, you're never alone. You might not have a support system at the time, but everyone in this room is your support system. So never give up. Take it a day at a time. Be your own advocate. But remember, you're never alone, and we're here to fight for you. Great, thank you. And one of the things, we have approximately 10 or 15 minutes. I want to open it up for questions from the audience and from online. If anybody has any questions, please, of our panel. We have a blue card here in the front. And I'm going to walk over here. From our online. On. So first question is, what nutritional and lifestyle changes do you, did you make? Uh, question number one, and did you do complementary therapies with treatment? So lifestyle changes that you made, and did you do complementary therapies with treatment? We'll start with Vicki. Um, as far as the lifestyle changes that I made, um, I was working at the time, so I went on total disability and I had to get used to that. I was more aware of eating healthier, not that I didn't eat healthy. I, you know, I did occasionally have junk food or pop or something, but I did start uh, eating healthier and reading more about nutrition and what I should or should not do. Uh, I'm an avid exerciser. I continued exercising and doing yoga. If I didn't feel up to that, I would be walking and, you know, just moving. I, I, I wouldn't just sit there. I would move. And what was the other question? Did you do complementary therapies with your treatment? No, I did not. So I actually underwent a complete lifestyle change because uh, I went from you know, having a normal diet to basically not being able to eat beyond, uh, I would say, what a baby would eat, what a two-year-old would eat. So for me, initially, it was quite difficult uh, to do that. And I went cold turkey on a number of things. Sugar went completely out of my diet. Caffeine went completely out of my diet for about a year. Um, and I just changed absolutely the entire way that I uh, thought about food and looked at food. Um, and to this day, I'm very much a believer in that. I eat very small portions at very regular intervals. Uh, so I try to maintain that. I do cheat once in a while. <laughs> um, and for me, um, I'm not an avid ex exerciser, but I do uh, walk a lot. Um, and in terms of lifestyle, I think uh, for me, the other biggest change was a psychological change. Um, I had actually, uh, I've, I lost both my parents to cancer, so I'd been through that, that experience. And then having gone through this, I basically just decided that life was just too short and uh, too precious to get caught up in all the extraneous stuff. So for me, it really is about looking at each day and being thankful for uh, saying that today I'm here and I'm here with you and I'm here to speak to you. Um, and so for that, for, for me, that was the biggest lifestyle change. Um, I did not have a complimentary um, uh, trials or anything beyond my uh, protocol. Thank you. Nelson. 
You know, the lifestyle change is really forced upon you when um, your stomach is removed, in my case, laparoscopically and robotically. Um, lost ultimately 70 pounds from start to finish. Uh, did not eat at all for 12 days that I was in the hospital. Uh, not only did I lose the pounds, I lost the muscle. I had no strength. I had no endurance. I had to go to eating little tiny, I'd almost call them snacks, eight times a day. My wife, Patty, was in the kitchen, it seemed like 24-7, because I was always ready to have another snack about every hour or two hours. Uh, but we created a regimen uh, and a spreadsheet, believe it or not, where we recorded every meal for about six months. I still have a record of that. If anyone would like to have a copy, you're welcome. <laughs> Uh, I did not, we did not get any help from the nutrition side of the industry. I think that's a, very much a weakness in the whole uh, healthcare field right now as it relates to gastric. I'm, I can't speak generally, but lots of protein shakes with whey powder and raw powder. Um, I could not endure, um, boost or endure or ensure. I didn't mean that for, the, for that to rhyme, but... <laughs> It really uh, just couldn't handle it. And sugar is very difficult. If you've heard of what dumping syndrome is all about, you kind of have to avoid sugar. Uh, it's, it's tough, but you make those lifestyle changes. As soon as I, I um, you know, got, got over the hump, I had complications where my anastomosis, the, the esophageal junction, closed up. So after three weeks, I could not swallow, three weeks after the surgery. It took 26 endoscopic dilations under full anesthesia over 14 months to reopen my esophagus. So uh, the nutritionist would say to me, you must have 2,300 calories a day or you're going to lose more weight and we're going to have to put a feeding tube in you. And that's another surgery. So it was kind of a threat. Well, I took that to heart and uh, I had as many protein shakes as I could, but I would not take the boost in the insurer. So we did it on our own without a feeding tube, but that's having the support system uh, that, that I had, which was, which was fantastic. Uh, then as soon as I could, into physical therapy, and actually uh, my healthcare insurance provided to have the physical therapist come into the home, and we started with the most elementary exercises you could imagine. I had no muscle left in my body, and today I'm, I'm in physical training and, and getting back on the golf course again. Complementary medicine, you can guess, having a daughter who's an acupuncturist. I did have acupuncture throughout the chemotherapy, which was a, a regimen called ECX. I was having it every single day orally with uh, something called Zolota. It's a toughie. I had every symptom. Uh, the acupuncture definitely helped with the symptoms. It also generally changes your attitude. And a positive attitude, of course, goes without saying. And the one thing I would also say is, if you can get over the question of why me, if you can forget that question, there is no answer. If you can accept it, you know, kind of epistemologically, that is no answer to why me, you will have a much better experience. Thank you, Nelson. Katerina, uh, same question. Yeah, so in terms of lifestyle changes, uh, like I said, I was a student at the time. Uh, I had to drop out, which uh, obviously caused a lot of psychological issues because uh, being a student was part of my identity at the time. And, uh, you know, just that loss of identity, not being able to graduate with my friends, not being able to uh, do school, do, do all the things that I used to do. So um, essentially, um, my, my days were, you know, go get chemo, come home, sleep, go get chemo, come home, sleep. So it, it, was, it was definitely tough psychologically. Um, in terms of um, after the gastrectomy, um, like Nelson said, uh, I actually lost 25 kilos. I'm not sure what that is in pounds because I'm Canadian. But <laughs> uh, yes, definitely a weight loss. And it was just an uphill battle uh, trying to gain the weight back. Uh, lots of protein shakes. Tried the Ensure, again, uh, with the sugar. Couldn't handle it. Lots of dumping syndrome. Um, it, it was a learning process. It was... Uh, 
definitely I had to start from the beginning and realize what worked for my body because although there are guidelines for post gastrectomy uh, those guidelines might not apply to you and a, a lot of those things I just I couldn't handle uh, definitely still have trouble with sugar right now but um, you know it's been three years since my diagnosis and I've, I've gained a little bit of weight and you know I'm, I'm happy I'm happy with that I'm, I'm proud of that right now I eat about three meals a day although they're not maybe as big as some people might eat uh, you know from those that were there at dinner with me yesterday I think I gave you a run for your money there so <laughs> you know I definitely uh, a lot of things went back to normal after um, the initial gastrectomy not everything but I learned I listened to my body and that's very very important post-surgery you know there are guidelines but it's what works for you oh and in terms of complementary surgery or complementary and alternative treatments I did not uh, do anything like that Thank you for that question, very interesting. And just to let you know, I think I said earlier, we do have webinars throughout the year that talk a little bit about uh, our nutrition. So hopefully that will help um, patients, uh, whether they're here online or on our um, website. And as you know, Dr. Kathleen Wessa will be covering a lot of that today as well. So thank you. Any other questions for the patient panel? Yes, we have a question here. You, if you wanna talk in the microphone or I can give you a question. Okay, here we go. Thank you so much. Okay, the next question is, what was your worst side effect and how did you deal with it, like for chemo? My worst uh, side effect was from Zolota and infusion 5-FU. I was not able to tolerate those. Uh, dehydration, I landed in the hospital the first time uh, five days and the second time three, I think. So it, it took the doctors a while to find the right chemo cocktail for me. Um, and uh, that was hard, just you know, being in the hospital and not being able to eat or keep anything on your stomach. and they're trying different things but after the third time they were able to find something that i would be able to tolerate and that was uh, carboplatin and taxol that was one of the cocktails great thank you very much how about you Teresa? so uh for me i was actually quite fortunate through treatment i um reacted quite well to the protocol the worst side effect for me was the minute the treatment stopped. I went into a severe, severe depression and anxiety for about three months where I basically could not be left alone for more than an hour because I thought the world was going to cave in and everyone around me was just not going to be there anymore. And I was actually diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. So I soldiered through the treatment. Uh, the doctors were incredibly impressed with how I dealt with it physically, but for me it was the after effects and the fact that I, I at one point I just thought, oh, I don't have any medication that's going to help me fight this. What's going to happen to me next? Uh, and so for me that was very difficult and uh, that lasted for about three months. I still do um, have someone that I go to regularly, and, uh, but that was the worst side effect for me. Nelson. Uh, if you pull out the, um, the sheet of side effects for uh, my protocol, which was ECX, um, I had the entire list. It's, it's hard for me to rank them, but I will say that my chemo was interrupted several times because my white blood cells became so low that I became, uh, I think it's, the term is neutropenic, and I had to have Nubigen uh, shots. Uh, I also lost magnesium at a rapid rate, which can be dangerous to have magnesium uh, go so low, and I had to have at least a dozen separate sessions where I would just go in and have magnesium, uh, you know, IVs for several hours rather than chemo. So uh, th those two things, and the hand foot, hand foot syndrome made life pretty intolerable. Your feet and your hands just turn raw and red and you can't walk and you can't hold anything in your hands. And much of that comes from the Zolota, as you said, mm -hmm. Vicki. Uh, but you know, in the end, my tumor was reduced by 30% and wow. it made my laparoscopic robotic procedure possible. So, as you said, uh, Teresa, you soldiered through, 
And you really have to do that. Mm. You have to soldier through. Uh, but you need a lot of people holding your hand. Thank you, Nelson. Ekaterina. Uh, yeah, so in terms of uh, chemotherapy side effects, the worst thing that happened to me was uh, also became neutropenic. So I had to have uh, neupogen injections because um, at several points during my chemotherapy, they wanted to um, stop it because my white blood cells were just not at the level that they could safely give me chemotherapy. Um, my worst side effect was from radiation um, because everything happened so quickly for me. I had open surgery for the gast total gastrectomy um, and then I had the chemo and the radiation. So I guess all of that compounded on my body and my body was really stressed out and my esophagus kind of closed up. And at one point, I already had issues with eating because I didn't have a stomach at that point. When my tube kind of shrunk, my esophagus tube shrunk from the radiation, um, that was just the worst. You know, I had to drink little sips of ground up meat because I was trying to gain the weight. I was trying to drink Ensure, but again, dumping syndrome because of the sugar. Um, so that was, that for me, that was the worst, worst thing when my uh, esophagus kind of closed up because of the radiation and all the stress on my body. Uh, just very, very difficult to eat, but you know, I did what I had to do. It was disgusting to eat uh, smoothies of meat, but you know, I had to do it because I couldn't lose any more weight. And you, again, you have to soldier through that kind of stuff. Great, thank you very much. Um, we're running out of time here, but I have one last question for each one of you, if you keep it short. One of the things, as you know, we have a PrEP program, a patient advocate group, um, that really takes care of um, you know, some of the patients that call in. Can you um, share with us, uh, you know, did you take part in the PrEP program, or, and what has um, the Debbie's Dream Foundation done for you? Uh, Debbie's Dream Foundation has made a world of difference for me. Uh, one of the patients and uh, founders of a chapter, Tony Leonard, I don't know if he's in the room, um, he is here this weekend. There was an article about him in the North Carolina newspaper, and I found out about Debbie's Dream Foundation through him, and I immediately contacted them, and they uh, scheduled me a prep. Uh, I had someone call me uh, who had, uh, his wife had had stage four stomach cancer. She had passed away, but he called and checked on me several times and talked to me and told me a little bit about her journey. And then I had another wonderful person, Robert, back in the room, who would call and check on me and just walk me through, and his wife, Deb, and they were just so sweet, and they email me and just keep, just keep you know, in touch, and that, that has really helped a lot. This is our second trip here. My husband and my daughter's here also. We were here last year, and, you know, we just really, really are thankful for Debbie and her team and what they're doing for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Vicki. Teresa. So um, I was introduced to Debbie's Dream Foundation through my medical oncologist back in Toronto who had met Debbie and said, that I absolutely needed to get involved in this foundation and become a part of it because they were doing such incredible work. And so I connected with Debbie, um, and it's a little bit different being in Canada versus being here in the States, different, uh, you know, different uh, protocols and, and different ways of looking at things. But uh, being a part of Debbie's Dream Foundation, we just started the chapter um, in Ontario less than a year ago, but it has really, uh, and I've started it with uh, Ekaterina, um, it has given me such a sense of giving back to people. I've been finally re ready and prepared to, to give back what I received, um, I received from ev everyone else. Um, I haven't done the PrEP program. We are going to begin that in Canada. We're very, very, very young in Canada, so we just started, and, but we're going full force. So, and I'm so happy that uh, we're able to be here and be a part of Debbie Stream Foundation. Well, I too am delighted to make a, to give a plug for Debbie's Dream Foundation. Um, I did have uh, we we discovered uh, Debbie's Dream Foundation. Uh, actually, my sister-in-law found it on the web and called me, and I did sign up uh, for the prep mentor program, uh, and my my mentor. Um, became known to me and my family as my angel. Uh, her name was Anna, a young woman who had preceded me by a couple of years. 
She was always there for me. She, we texted and we emailed, we talked on the phone. Every time I had a question or I got down about something, she was there for me. She also picked up the phone and called her surgeon at Sloan Kettering and said, I have a mentee who needs a total gastrectomy. You know, he would like to come and see you. I got a phone call back that same afternoon. This is one of the busiest surgeons in America. Uh, and I was able to be scheduled right away. Um, she was my angel and she still is today. Um, I wish she were in the room today. I know she's not. I couldn't have gotten through without her. And so today, uh, I have been a mentor now for about a year myself, um, and it's a very rewarding experience, and I plan on staying uh, involved with Debbie's Dream Foundation for as long as I have the energy to do so. Thank you, Nelson. Hey, Katerina. <clears throat> so, yeah, um, at the time of my diagnosis, uh, like I was saying, I, I felt very alone. I, I didn't really know who to turn to. I didn't know who to ask the questions because um, although my oncology team was amazing, uh, a lot of the times I just, there was no, not enough time to ask all the questions. Um, so I actually went on a bunch of forums and I posted, hey, I'm 21, got gastric cancer, anyone else? And uh, during my treatment, uh, nobody really replied. It was only uh, after my treatment that I was fortunate enough to ha get an email from Teresa over here. And she actually emailed me and she said, you know, I'm, I'm a young patient, I, I also have gastric cancer, can we connect? And through that, we started going on coffee dates, you know, I, I, I tried my best to guide her um, in, you know, her treatment. And then eventually, her um, oncologist actually introduced us to Debbie's Dream Foundation. And, you know, Looking at that website, this is the answer for me, at least. I, I wish I wish I had Debbie's Dream Foundation at the time uh, to look at all this information because, as, as you can see, even from this patient panel, we're such a diverse group of patients, and we're here and we're able to speak to so many people out there right now and give that information, answer questions, anything. Um, the Prep Mentor Program, they connect you to people that are similar age, similar stage, similar uh, diagnostic criteria. And, you know, being such a diverse group of people, we're able to connect through Debbie's Dream Foundation. And I'm so, so, so grateful for it. So thank you, Debbie's Dream Foundation. <laughs> thank you so much, absolutely. So one of the things as, um, actually, thank you so much for the panel here, the patient panel, uh, for sharing your your story that can help other uh, patients and caregivers out there. You are our heroes, and thank you so much for sharing. And what we're going to do now is we're going to switch over and have our talks. So while I'm, I'm going to give some some um, other announcements. We're going to do a switching here. Um, if, if you guys can help me switch with the name tags up front, that would be great. Um, one of the things I want to do is tell you is that the PrEP program, we have a wonderful person who's leading our PrEP program. Her name is Mary Margaret. She's in the back of the room. Raise your hand, Mary Margaret. Thank you so much for all you do, Mary Margaret. And if anybody has um, any desire to join our uh, prep program, um, whether you want to be, you know, contribute of your time as a mentor um, or you need somebody, please see Mary Margaret. So thank you for that. Um, so we're going to have our first presenter as she moves her way <laughs> to the front. So and while, while they're coming up to the front, one of the things that I want to talk about is we have an incredible, uh, not only board of directors, but we have an incredible medical team. Now, these people are the who's who in oncology when it comes to stomach cancer, and I'm just so pleased to have them.